All right, we get into the meat of today's service experience, and I would like to invite two wonderful people who will be joining me in taking this discussion further. One is a pastor internally here. We all know her. Can we give it up for Pastor Chi as she joins me up on stage? All right, and then the second person is someone who's not a stranger to us in this house, even though we've missed having him around. He's not been here in quite a bit, yeah, but he's someone who's been a part of this journey with us literally since the inception. He's, been, he's very close to me and my family, and I'm really grateful that every time we call upon him and his wife, they always show up for us. So guys, with a rousing warm applause, can we please make welcome Pastor Samson Issa. <laughs> Sam, can we have the mics please? All right. Okay, thank you so much, Pastor Sam. So I'm going to ask, I'll start off with you and just ask that you do a quick introduction. Actually, let me start with Chine. Just quick introduction. I know a lot of people know that you are the pastor in charge of prayer in this church. And not only is she in charge of prayer in this church, she's also in charge of money. Just in case you think I'm the one that is managing the money of the church. She manages the finances and also she leads a prayer team. Um, well, she pastors the prayer team. We have someone who directly leads the prayer team. So what else do you do, Chine, aside from what you do in church? Hi, everyone. Okay, my name is Chine Alalibo. Um, <laughs> Love it. <laughs> um, like Pastor said, division head for finance, prayer ministry, and partnerships. I serve here at LifePoint. Um, but beyond that, I see myself... I am God's daughter, shining his light wherever I find myself, within my sphere of influence. But beyond the work that I do here at LifePoint, I'm a chartered accountant and a certified management consultant. And I am co-founder for two startups, one in EdTech and another one in digital technology. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you so much for sharing. Because I find that a lot of people don't know what our pastors do. You are just assume we hold mics here every Sunday. And all we do is we pray and fast and read Bible, and sit in one room all day, every day. But we are actually light in the marketplace. All right, Pastor Sam, uh, what do you do, sir? Aside from pastoring is, at Elevation Church. My name is, wow, this microphone is giving me big buzz. You know. but <laughs> first, before I introduce myself, I've been so blessed by this choir. Can we put our hands together for Woo! them? Go Life Point <laughs> Band. <laughs> I've been very beautiful coming here today. And it's, my name is Samson Issa. Um, a telecoms expert. I run a business, uh, manage a business for an American company, uh, looking after the business in West Africa. I've been in telecoms for many, many years, for over 20 years. I'm a leader at the Pistic Center. Um, I'm a pastor. I'm very passionate about family and also building men. That's all about me. That's all. Thank you so much for sharing, sir. Okay, so uh, for the benefit of anyone who's worshipping with us for the first time, either in person or online, um, we started a teaching series a few weeks back, right, which we've also then been deep diving on at our 680 meetings on Wednesday. But it's about stewardship and generosity, and that's what we're going to be talking about this morning. I'm going to start off with a question here that someone has shared says, Pastor, that pastor is me, so they have called me out. He said, Pastor referenced the widow of Zarephath last week, and I can't get that picture out of my head. There's no way on God's green earth that I'd be comfortable with giving anyone who's not my family member the last bit of food in my home during a famine. My question is twofold. Why would a God who is good put us through seasons and requests like this. And if I can lay on that, right, is the story of, not only is it the story of the widow of Zarephath, because I shared two stories. One was the widow of the Zarephath from First Kings, and of course, the story of the Good Samaritan. But we can even understand that the Good Samaritan is wealthy, perhaps, was the reason why he could say, 
open check, you know, whatever bills are incurred, I will cover it. But this question is asked by a young person, and so we're thinking here limited resources mm -hmm. somewhat. And the only other person in scripture that comes to mind, I mean, aside from the ultimate sacrifice that Jesus gave, you know, that God gave through uh, by giving us his son, is Abraham, when God said to him to go and sacrifice the son that he had been waiting for after he had given birth to him. He says, the second question is, how do I grow to become one of those people who can do what this widow did? Because currently, I don't think I have the grace for this. So I'll start off with you, Pastor Sam. Um, to be very honest, I'm not sure if I would have actually given something to Prophet Elijah because it was a very dare situation. Um, but then... God is infinite mercy. Whenever God speaks, grace is released. So the woman was walking by the grace of God. And one of the things I will say is, again, the woman was actually a very generous woman. Because and generosity is not about finances. It's about a posture. and It's all about your mindset. How generous are you about your words to people? How kind are you? And if you're kind in the little things of life, you know, praising people, uh, appreciating people, showing empathy, um, then when the big things of life come in, it's much easier for you to act because there's grace release. But if you're very stingy with your words, not, not, I'm not talking about even money. Yeah. Stingy with your words and your character towards other people, then there will be contradiction because you can't enjoy that grace. The, the first thing that happens to you is your mindset blocks it immediately because you're not that posture, you're not even there at first. So you can't even receive grace because you've been a stingy person with your disposition with how you treat people, with how mercy you sh the mercy you show to people. So that's the first thing I'll talk about, right? The second part is how would you continue? Oh, can you repeat that question, please? How do I grow to become such a person? I, I think it's a perfect practice makes perfect. You start by treating, being generous with your words. Things that you don't lose anything. You know, it's so difficult for somebody to see you here and say, oh, Pastor Bussola, it's lovely, right? And what you start from that position where you're generous with your time, service. Uh, as a church, our DNA is to serve. Is a who, any amongst you that wants to be great should force what? Well, should force serve. Yeah. So start by service. Start by, by being gracious to people. Start by helping people. Start by by showing empathy, start by showing mercy to people and little things of life. And then slowly, because there's grace release, mm. I, I, I have something very interesting that I, I do. Um, I, I used to trust God, and I up to now, I used to pray that God, who do you want me to bless today? Mm. As in, from morning, I wake up, and I could look at my wife, I could say, I want to do something to you. It could be my daughter, it could be on the way. I bought a bottle of granite, and I said, there's the change of 200 or 500, I so said, you hold it. So I'm consistently thinking of who will I bless today? It could be the security man at my office. It could be the receptionist. I'm thinking of who should I bless? And I could say, oh my word, I love that top. So start from there. Thank you so much for that, sir. Please let's put our hands together for him. So two things I hear you say fundamentally. One is dealing with the mindset um, that prevent you from being generous and secondly is practicing it even in the little things being empathetic um showing mercy giving your time um, beyond aside from even just financial gifts right um so thank you for sharing that i will take a question on on mindset shortly but i want to hear chi what do you have to say to this how has this worked for you i want you to personalize it yeah so for me the key thing there is honor um, because if you read that story in First Kings 17, especially from verses 8 to 10, you see that God gave the instruction to Elijah and then said to him that he had commanded the widow of Sarephat. So he spoke to both of them, right? 
The widow honored Elijah. That was an opportunity for God to connect to people. So essentially, in the place of honor, there is a connection that God had orchestrated. So we need to be mindful of when we receive such instructions, how that there is something that God is trying to work out for us. Because it's a famine. She could have decided to withhold. There's that scripture that speaks about the one that withholds and tends to poverty. She could have decided to withhold what she had. And when she finishes eating it, that's it, right? But in the place of obedience, in the place of obedience to that instruction that she received and honoring the man of God, she received her own abundance. Of course, that meant she wasn't operating from a scarcity mindset. So for me, honor and obedience to the place of instruct, to the instructions that we receive from God. Yeah. Thank you so much for that. Now, you both have touched on mindset, and I know that when we taught this last week, I did spend a bit of time talking through the two major mindsets that undergird generosity or stewardship. One is an abundance mindset, and the other is a scarcity mindset. The abundance mindset, you know, recognizes that, look, regardless of the situation, I have opportunities to recreate, to rebuild. Uh, the scarcity mindset focuses more on how resources are depleting, and so enters into self-preservation mode or starts to deal with fear and in, in sometimes greed then sets in because you're anxious to keep what you have because you don't want to lose it. Now, this question says, if scarcity is a mindset, then it's a mindset I have. I didn't grow up with a lot. No one around me had a lot. And my circumstances trained me to value and hold on to what I have for a rainy day. I think a lot of us grew up with that, where you're, where you're constantly told to, to keep things for the rainy day, yeah? It says, how do I begin to practice an abundance mindset? And I want you to help us personalize this. If you backtrack that to your 20s, right, how do you, because one of the things that I've heard about you, not from you obviously, but from people, is the fact that you're a very generous person, right? And you have been a faithful steward of your time. We see it even in the, in the way your career path has panned out. So how have you been able to build an abundance mindset over time that has helped you become this person who's stewarding resources and God can even entrust resources into your hands? Um, I'm not exactly what she's saying. I'm not that very generous. I'm on a journey, right? So just to correct that. Um, so, I, I think I would, I would thank my father if he's late, because I grew up in a family where my father was very generous, and I had cousins and nieces coming to stay in our home. So, I'm used to people. I love people, right? And this unconsciously, right? So, you must empathize with this person, because if you are in a nuclear family where you don't have anybody around you, and there was lack around you, the propensity for you to behave like him is very high, right? So we can't judge him for that behavior. Um, I think that's my blessing that I have, I'm very fortunate, but it's very interesting because my senior brother and my other sisters, are, I'm sorry to say, they're actually very stingy. And <laughs> so, so I, I am just, I, God just had mercy on me. But growing up, um, I realized that because I love people, I was very kind, even before I met Christ, right? Because of my temperament, and I would get you into a place here, I am um, a choleric and a sanguine. So generally, the sanguine personality like people, right? The melancholy and the phlegmatic are a bit withdrawn right? And the tendency for them to be very analytical with their finances, right? And go into their cocoon is very high. So, personalities also might play a part, right? But however, so growing up, because of my temperament, I, I like people, and therefore what happened to me over the years is, as I bless people, I've seen that somehow God has a way. I'm not blessing people because I'm waiting for God to bless me. Not at all. It's just my nature to do it. And i give you some few examples. Um, 
I remember very well many years ago that I had a missionary partner. So one of the things I did was, as I was, I was a bachelor, when I go to people's home, I never went empty-handed. So when... <laughs> I don't need to right? see the face that spoke. <laughs> so, so I never went empty-handed. I'd always buy things for the family. It could be yam, tubers of yam, you know, it could be whatever I could get. I would just go and bless them. And what I realized is that people were very warm towards me. They loved me because of that. So a generous person would always attract people. Right? So if you're stingy, people would unconsciously resist. You carry an aura that unconsciously people will resist you. But if you're generous, I've seen in my life, I would say, people just like me. I don't know why. But there's an aura that you carry that attracts people. So what I've seen is that I became a partner to a missionary. And one day, the missionary was in Lagos. I had some money. And I was looking out for him. And I said, sir, where are you? He said, he's in Lagos. I said, I have something for you, sir. He said he wanted to buy, he was, there was a surgery on him, so they cut off one of his legs. Uh, one of those, what's the name of the legs you buy? Prosthetic. Pro prosthetic, thank you very much. And I sent him some money, and it was exactly the money he needed to buy the legs. And his wife and him were crying. And when they told me, I was also crying. But I have seen again and again as you reach out to people, but somehow, because you are a steward of his blessing, you begin to take the burden of the Lord. And whenever I remember another story of a young man that was working for a church and his term has expired and the, and the church told him to leave the accommodation that he was. And I called him one morning. I told him that the Lord is leading me to give you a certain amount of money. And he just started crying with his wife. And he said they were just packing their loads. His wife was about going to Abiyakuta to stay with the children and her parents. But this money I've given him was enough to pay the rent that they needed. So it's a consistent practice. And then you begin to hear God. Because you can hear God to be a blessing to other people, you will also hear God concerning your life. Yes. Yeah. Thank you so much for that. And I think one fundamental thing you've highlighted is the fact that you actually started even before you got married. I feel like a lot of young people, we want to wait to hammer and to blow before we are then generous, you know. Um, but what I hear you say is you start with the little, visiting people, taking something little to them, just loving people. And we always say in this house that people are God's priority. So when you prioritize God's priority, surely you are entering into partnership with him over them. All right. Thank you again, sir. Um, Chi, I'm going to ask you this. Second Corinthians 9, 8. This question says, I got this scripture during PG's teaching. Pastor Godman took the first service for this series. It says, and it marked me in a way I had never fully gotten before. God is able to. But this doesn't seem to be happening for me. I have never been poor, thank God, but abundance, I've never had that either. If God is able, what am I doing wrong? Why does it seem like I have just enough and never more than I need? That's a scripture that says that God is able to make all grace abound to you. Yeah, so speaking about abounding towards, speaking about the blessings of God, we can look at the blessings of God in two folds, right? There's the positional blessing, which he has already given to us in Christ Jesus. Pastor Ayo has taught us extensively of what we have available to us by reason of our position, right? So if you haven't been coming for Bible study, this is me inviting you to Bible study. So we've done that extensively. So that's one angle, our positional blessings. The other one is our experiential blessings, which is what this person is speaking to. I haven't been able to experience this. I haven't been able to see this manifest in my life. That takes time, right? And the reason is because the world that we live in today, there are different types of conditioning. The world is conditioning us in a different way, in a particular way, which when we look at it, we will see that it is very different from what the word of God says, right? Remember, we're talking about an abundance mindset, living by revelation as contained in the word of God. So for me, what I would say to this person, to 
come to that place where you are experience, experiencing that blessing, having that experiential blessing, you need to recondition your mind to understand the promises, to understand the things that are available to you as one who has been bought with a price, as one who Jesus died and rose for. And that means that you need to spend time in the word of God. So quality time quantity time right quantity over a period of time quality time understand what the word says concerning the provisions that god has made available to you when we declare here every sunday we say that we are channels through which god's blessings flow to the families of the earth right pastor isa has spoken about that in terms of us positioning ourselves so that god can use us to bless others right we also then need to continue to recondition ourselves because we go out in the world we have our careers our work things we do in the world we need to make sure that in our minds our minds is focused on the word right not the world which is the scarcity mindset i want to hammer mindset i want to get it all right but living in the abundance mindset as contained in the word of god is focusing our minds on the word the promises of the god of god for us the lord is my shepherd i shall not want the band sang it this morning like right um god is able to supply all of my needs all of those promises that god conditioning our mind consistently which is why i said in the beginning it takes time so we come to that place where we know and our mind is fully aware of all of the promises that we have as contained in the scriptures awesome thank Let you so much please, please. Uh, yes uh, one is to be grateful have a grateful heart you know consistently be grateful for what you have the second one is to live in the present. The Bible, the prayer says, give us this day our daily bread. The man that appreciates what God is doing now. The challenge we have about abundance is because most people are living in their future. In the sense that I'm afraid my rent will soon expire. I'm planning for this. I'm planning for that. And then they forget that you would only see tomorrow if today works. Mm. So you must consistently live in the present. The, what God promised us is that he will give us this day our daily bread. Yeah. Tomorrow is in his hands. Live in the present. The, 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 why you don't have an abundance mindset that you think that until like Pastor Bosa says, until you have excess. No. Out of the little you have, yeah. when you bless somebody, it's abundance. So it's not when you have excess that you don't know what to do with it. No. The little you have, can you take out of it and bless somebody? The widow of Zarephath was an abundant mindset woman. Yeah, yeah. Because she took out of nothing yeah. and gave the prophet. Yeah. Yeah. That's the mindset we should have. Thank you so much for that, sir. And, you know, it, it reminds me of, of something Jesus said while he and his disciples were observing people who were given into the treasury, given their offerings in scripture. You know, the rich and the wealthy came and they gave. But the woman who came, you know, the widow who came with her little might, yes. Jesus, you know, complimented her. Right. And obviously, when you study scripture, you would understand that, just as China spoke, the conditioning, Jesus' conditioning obviously is very different from what we see and observe in the world today. The expectation is, oh, someone gives a million dollars. That's huge. That's massive. That's what, the, the church will do a lot with that. As again, somebody who gave 10K out of her 12K, mm. right? But Jesus complimented that person to say, look, this one is more the cheerful giver, is more the willing giver. This one is the one that will be blessed because the others have given out of the abundance that they have, right? All right. Thank you so much for that, sir. And you did speak about planning. So I want to take a quick question on that. And for everyone, the number you can send your questions in, those in the room and everyone online, just drop your, your questions in the comment section and we will take those quickly. It says, scriptures like take no worry for tomorrow and be anxious for nothing seem impractical to me. I'm a planner and I like to know that tomorrow's issues are well in hand today. So how do I practically live the kind of carefree life or live this kind of carefree life care in terms of worry free now and more pertinently does it actually work now the context of that scripture comes from Matthew chapter 6 and it was just after the beatitude right Jesus was speaking to the disciples right and if you look at Matthew chapter 6 it's a, it's a classic it's powerful it started by saying 
man shall not serve mammon or and, and God at the same time. Right? God expects us to plan. It's so critical. The biggest problem of Nigeria is poor planning and the inability for us to implement those plans. Right? And that has cascaded down to us as a people so much more that people cannot plan beyond a week or two weeks. But many years ago, when I was much younger, Nigeria had a five year rolling plan, you know, and that continually governments after governments were, were, were using the plan. But back to this question we're not saying that you should live a carefree life, but we're saying that have faith. The life of a believer is a life of working with God and having faith. Yeah. And faith is saying that, you know, it's a substance of things hoped for, the evidence of no sin. It said, it said, it said, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Yes. The proceeding word is what keeps us. It said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that what? That proceeds. Mm. So the proceeding word is what keeps us as believers. Now, that means that today I have a word that comes from the Lord. It keeps me. Tomorrow, the Lord might be speaking something fresh. But he could all, as well tell me that what I told you yesterday, Samson, is still fresh. Again, tomorrow, God could say, I'm sending something new. The Bible said that he does new things every day. Yeah. Right? He loves us with benefits every day. So, it's the mindset of trusting God and working by faith. We're not saying you should be careless, but you cannot live in anxiety and fear about tomorrow. Oh, Nigeria, oh, the dollar, oh, the pounds. You can't live like that. We are not late. He said, those that are sons of God, Romans chapter, chapter 8, verse 14, are the sons of God. You must be led by the Spirit. So that's all we're saying. Don't be careless, but you can't walk in fear and anxiety. It's of the devil. Thank you, sir. Can, can uh, you just add? Uh, yes, yes. Go ahead. So I saw an acronym that I just want to share because Pastor Issa already spoke about faith and fear. We already know fear. False evidences appearing, appearing real. real. Mm -hmm. I saw something for faith. It says, forever, always, I trust him. So coming to that place where we trust God, that we can commit our plans to him, and those plans are not driven by fear, but they are driven by our faith and our trust in God. Thank you so much, pastors. Okay, so we have a number of questions in. I would take some of them quickly. Let me start with this first one. And maybe I would not have bothered with this question, right? But I think it's important to address some cultural notions that, um, and, and cultural mindsets that affect us as believers, right? Scripture says that we are in the world, but we are not of this world. And if you've been with us in this church, you will know that there are things we are very clear on regarding our identity. But the question goes thus. It says, I want to be generous, but there have been instances where people use the money they received for negative purposes, such as giving it to one baba to attack the giver of the money, maybe to transfer the giver's wealth to him. Since I learned about these situations, I have become more hesitant to give money to beggars on the streets. How do I give, even with these possibilities? Pastor Sam, because I don't want to say the one that is in my mouth. <laughs> so, sir, over to you. Um, it's in him we live, we walk, and we have our being. You can't preserve yourself. It's only God that can protect you. We're not saying you should be careless. We're not saying you should be foolish, but you got to trust God on a daily basis. Now, I remember many years ago, I used to drive and up to now where I live. I mean, when I drive, I give people a ride, but a lot of people have been attacked. People's cars have been snatched because they gave people rides, right? But I've been doing that for over 30 something years since I got my first car. And God has kept me. Be led, be led, be led. Those that are sons of God, Romans chapter 8, verse 14, are the, that ones that are led. led by the Spirit. Mm. Be led. But in an effort to do that, be also vulnerable. People have taken advantage of me. Mm. People have turned me into a small God. So whenever they have a problem, it's me they are looking for. 
And I said, ah, but before me, don't you have anybody? There is an old colleague of mine that we used to work when I worked for MTN many years ago. And she sent me a request to send her money. And out of the blue, so I said, oh, wow. I sent her money. The second time, the second time she sent me again, I said, ah. I said, auntie, I will send you this money, but I have a challenge. The challenge is that I will not become your source. Please, after this one, can you look for somebody else to help you? Surely, the next time she sent me for another, she said, yes, I won't disturb you. After this, I won't ask you for money. I saw another WhatsApp again from her. What am I talking about? Be vulnerable. It's better you are at the side of giving than receiving. Never imagine where you are. You need to be humble and grateful. Don't be foolish about it. People will take advantage of you. But the more people take advantage of you, the more God provides. The doors will open. He said, I will give you press down, shaking together, running over. For many years, God has been providing for me. So don't be afraid. All right. Thank you, sir, for that. Let me say something to that. Um, okay, the quickly, please. The angle of um, people not wanting to give because they are, people are going to take your money to wherever they want to take it to. Me, how I approach that is, first of all, everything I have, God gave to me. Right, so it, there's a scripture in James that says every good and perfect gift comes from God. So it is not actually Chinese money, it is God's money. China is the steward, right? So if I give it to you and you use it to do whatever, I am hidden in Christ. So if what you are doing cannot Hallelujah. affect Christ, it cannot affect China. Absolutely. Right, so it come, it's a mindset thing. So yeah. if you understand who you are and your identity in Christ, understand that you are just a steward, that resource, whatever it is, the money, it's God's money, and you're just a steward. Give it. Whatever they are doing with it, if it cannot affect the owner, the one who has given you the resource, it cannot affect you. Amen. I'm so tempted to speak on that, but let's move on. We don't have time. It's, uh, this question says, how does a Christian balance giving and saving? Are there times the Spirit of God will stop you from giving? Pastor Sam. Giving and saving. Saving. Saving, yes. It says, and then at that times, the Spirit of God will stop you from giving. <laughs> well, this is quite interesting. Look, we, we should look at our life is about seasons, right? Rome, uh, Genesis 8.22 said, as long as the earth remains, seed time and harvest, summer and winter, hot and new, would not cease. There, is, there are times, there's time for everything. Ecclesiastes says that. Right? Savings is extremely important. One of the biggest culture we lack in this part of the world is that we, we lack savings. The Asian culture, they save, right? And we are a bit careless. So we spend so much money on clothes and, and, and cars, right? Consumables, right? But the Asian culture, they have taught how to save. And more, maybe that's why they are very rich and we're very poor, right? So, we need to learn the place of saving is extremely important. Even if it's a thousand naira, can you save Something one thousand naira? Yeah. However, we are men of faith. If you are led to give, if you're a married man, don't give everything without talking to your spouse or married woman. Don't say that God led you and you give the whole family saving and then you put your family into trouble. God is not the author of confusion. Absolutely. So, what I would suggest is that there's nothing wrong in giving, but saving is very, very important. And God that will bless you. And you know, we have this tendency to use that God will bless you because you've given your offering. No, 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 no. No. Offering is a sign. It's offering. is showing God that you yeah. love him. Yeah. No, if you give because you're demanding God to give you back, then there's a problem there. I think they need to, need to do some teaching there, uh, Pastor Busola. Because God, we are blessed with all what? Spiritual blessings in heavenly places. I'll stop there so that we can go. To Thanks a lot, sir. You know, I'm, yeah, please go ahead and appreciate Pastor Sam. There's, there's a lot of wisdom to be applied. And one of the things that is very clear, one of the benefits that we have as believers is access to the wisdom of God, right, to the mind of God. 
Um, and God expects us to be able to live wisely. So I, in addition to everything Pastor Sam has said about saving and also giving, being led to give, I'm reminded of the scripture that speaks about the one that doesn't take care of his household is worse than an infidel. Because I know that a lot of young people, maybe not a lot, but some young people, at least that I have encountered in my journey, have shared instances where they've had parents who've given everything they have, you know, to church, to, to charitable walks, you know. They give externally, but there is a lot of poverty and, and they don't care for the people in their own home. Just to say that God doesn't appreciate that type of giving because the expectation is that you must take care of the people that you have Praise first God. before you start to, to look outward. And it doesn't mean that he won't lead you to give. He will. But like he said, if you're going to give the family savings, then there has to be agreement, especially if you're married. If you're a single, you can get away with all those things, right? Give everything you have and you drink, or you know God will sort you out somehow. But when you're married and you have kids and you take your children's school fees and you go and say you are doing one powerful giving, one powerful seed, <laughs> the Lord does not reward such. Because your child then stays at home, that child becomes, that child will now come and share God's experience a few years after. And remind us of what that parent did. The Lord help us to be wise in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so this question says, I want to be generous, but there have been instances where... Okay, no, I've read that. Um, it says, please, pastor, what happens when I feel pity on a beggar, but my mind kicks against helping them? I think that has been answered already. Be led by the Spirit of God, okay? And let me take this last question, because I want Pastor Sam to lead us in prayer. Now... A major barrier to generosity is greed. Greed prioritizes possession over purpose. And I'm going to just list very quickly, just to help someone here, what greed looks like, right? The different expressions of greed. One is an excessive desire for material things. The second is excessive desire for non-material things. Fame, influence, acceptance, you want to belong, Acquisition, motivation, compulsive desire to acquire more. Just not knowing when to stop. For some people, shoes, bags, people who go borrow money to buy the latest bag, and then they'll be doing some dear, dear, pay small, small. Retention, motivation, desire to hold on what you have. We've established that that comes from a scarcity mindset. Then insatiability, gluttony, you're just never satisfied. And of course, the last is a disregard for the cost of obtaining your desire, spending more than what you earn, living above your means, and going to any length, cut soap for me, going to any length to get what you want, right? Now, this person says, if greed is holding on to more than I need, just taking one of those, or just putting everything together and understanding the context of greed we're talking about, he says, how do I know what is more than what I need? Because I need a lot. It takes a lot to keep spirit, soul, and body together. And I'm sure that in this Tinubu economy, a lot of young people agree, right, that it takes quite a lot. So, <laughs> wow. So, sir, can you speak to that very quickly for us? How do you know what is more than you need? And I think fundamentally, this person is asking subtly, how do I get to that place of contentment, even with what I have? Wow. Can you give it a shot before you? I've been talking a lot, so let her, let her talk. <laughs> so for me, I would say, um, what drives greed, right? All of these things that Pastor has mentioned, if you look underneath it, it's fear, right? Fear of not belonging. Fear of not being able to meet your needs. Fear of not having to please whoever right, that you want to please. I think the first thing is that we need to recondition our minds out of operating from fear and coming from a place of faith. I know that I'm speaking a lot on mind change, mindset change and reconditioning because that is fundamental to this conversation and that will help us in the long run in terms of how we see things, how we give, and even how we act with everyone, right? So I would say for this person, let fear stop driving you. Let faith drive you. There's already a provision for you as contained in the word of God, right? Of course, there is the planning that you then need to do. Because sometimes what happens with some of these things is that we want to live above our means. We see people on social media 
we see our, in quotes, league people or people we went to school with or whatever, and we feel that we have to be at where they are, forgetting that life is in times and in seasons. They might be in their season of flourishing, but you are in your season of planting, right? So sometimes we forget all of these things and we just want to blow and we just want to go from zero to 1,000 in 10 seconds, right? So for this person, I would say, let fear stop driving you and let faith drive you. Pastor Issa has speaking about, spoken to what faith is in terms of hearing and hearing the word of God. Conditioning your mind till you come to the place where you know that whatever it is that you need, God has already provided. Then what you then need to do in terms of managing the resources that you have, because there is also wisdom. Pastor spoke to that earlier. There is also wisdom that we receive from God to manage, to be good stewards, to the resources he has given to us. So all that we then need in that direction, we receive that wisdom from God to be able to manage all of these resources such that we are able to meet our needs and God is our provider. So one, recognizing God as your source. Two, moving from the place of fear to the place of faith. And three, having the wisdom to manage the resource that God has committed to us. Thank you so much. Can I just add you? I think you said it all, but the Bible said godliness with contentment I was just gonna is a great quote gift. that scripture, you know? yes. Contentment is extremely important. And the way you're content is when you live a simple life. I listened to a guy called Zach Pona. Zach Pona is in his 80s, and he's an old Indian guy. He said for over 50 something years, he'd never borrowed one cover. And his children read in the US and the rest. Why? He lives a simple life. The challenge we have is that we're not living simple lives. There's so much desire and pursuit to show off, yeah. to compete. Yeah. So you mentioned that very well. And that is a challenge we have. And sometimes even us, we put pressure on people. So some people didn't come to church this morning because they didn't find a new dress. And, and, and sometimes, you know. <laughs> and, Here at Life Point, come as you are. Amen. That's, that's our MO, you come know, as you are. T-shirts, you know, <laughs> jeans. But, 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 but that is a challenge of our society. When we start comparing ourselves with the other person. Mm, comparison. Living with the Joneses, right? peer pressure, especially the age group of this church, there's so much pressure, you know, the last young, young lady got married, and me, I must get married too, so there's also pressure there, so it cut across everything, when you don't live a simple life, I encourage all of us, from the food, you see, in Nigeria, when you go to parties, you see how people pile food, and they won't finish it, that's the first sign of greed, you go for buffet, you see the amount of food people pack? So sometimes the money you have paid for that buffet <laughs> is worrying you. And so you see people actually so, want to use that money. So, so, so our greed level is actually institutionalized in Nigeria to the yeah. point that even government, right, the level of how people steal is greed. They don't need it. Yeah. Even their whole village will not finish the money. You know, yet they stack it up. Yeah. So the the, the panacea to that is contentment. Mm. It's living a simple life. If I have one pair of shoes, if I have two, if I have shirts. So some of you here need to go to your wardrobe. The shoes you are keeping that you have not used for six months, it's a sign of grief. Why are you keeping it? <laughs> Somebody needs it. Right? Clothes, the clothes perfumes, you have. Yeah. The perfumes you have. There are certain things you have. You, know? you have five cars. You've not used one. For two, two years, you don't need it. Let's live a simple life, and then things will be much easier for us. Mm. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, so our time is, well, technically up, but there are two questions I want us to take very quickly because they border on very critical matters. One has to do with, like, marriage, and I know a lot of young people just speaking to the uh, comparison and competition and pressure that exists sometimes it's not even the press it's not even the young people now it's their parents yeah. right so this question says says i'm a yoruba man about to get married soon and you know what they say about yoruba people we love a good party all expectations of wise resource allocation have gone out of the window in my conversations with my to-be in-laws how do i explain that a good steward doesn't use resources this way May your in-laws not come for me. 
So I say it's because you heard teaching on stewardship in church. It says, I guess my question is, what do we do when the divine principles of good stewardship clash with cultural expectations? Um, this, this is a tough question. Because even Jesus said that your traditions have made the word of God of none effect. Yes. There are certain cultures that we have in Nigeria that are very obnoxious. For example, spending your whole fortune on a dead person. You know, and it, 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 it doesn't make sense, mm. right? But it's cultural, mm. right? Now, for this man, it has to be a journey in dealing with your in-laws. And also, your wife-to-be. Have you had conversations so on, what is her position? Yeah. on your position? Do your parent-in-laws know you as a man of faith? Do they trust you? Right? It has to be a journey. You can't wake up overnight and say you're a good steward on the wedding day. No, they don't know you like that. <laughs> right? Because there's, there's culture, and culture is very powerful. Yeah. Right? It's a culture we eat strategy, strategy for breakfast. Right? For breakfast yeah. right? So you can't start speaking in tongues when it comes to the wedding, when they don't know. All this while, they don't know your lifestyle. You have been showing off with nice cars, and now for a one-day party, you are saying that you don't have money. No, it can't happen. It has to be a journey. Your in-laws must know that you are very frugal. Mm. Though you have money, but you're very frugal. And, that, and they have to accept it. Otherwise, you don't want to marry their daughter, right? But if you have to marry their daughter, you have, they have to be compromised. So you that like parties, what will you bring? Exactly. You know? So those compromises must be there. I trust that wisdom will guide this person. Amen. Amen. Please ask those fundamental questions because it's critical. If they are placing certain demands, it's what are you bringing to the table? Yeah? If not, let's begin to read. Because otherwise, <laughs> the wedding is just one aspect of it. And I say all the time that it's not even the most important part of everything. The marriage itself is the one that is critical, that attention needs to be paid to. And I understand all of these cultural nuances that exist. But if you do not know how to navigate those before you even start the marriage, then it, it will be problematic. Let's take this last question, Chi, and I'll, I'll pass this to you I want to quickly. I on savings for the wedding, right? Because mm. sometimes we find ourselves that, okay, I have a wedding, and then that's where people start running helter-skelter. As a young adult, you should already be saving for your wedding. That is if you want to get married. Male, female, it is not gender specific, right? Yes, so. Absolutely. If, uh, yes, very, 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 very important. Very important. If you are saving for a car or saving for whatever, and a car is not even an asset, but let's not go there. But if you are saving for whatever, make sure that you're setting some money apart, monthly, quarterly, annually, towards your wedding. So that when you eventually get to that bridge, you have some help to help you to cross it. So that when you are having these conversations with your in laws, you already have something, and you can then define your budget and start from there. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you so much for that. Last question so that we can spend some time praying. It says, how should you deal with being generous to people who don't deserve it? And this one is very important, right? Because um, I think it was Bible study maybe two or so months back. We touched on it. It says, how do you deal with people with generous... Oh, sorry, how do you deal with being generous to people who don't deserve it People who have a track record for either being ungrateful or consistently taking advantage of you. I know Pastor Sam had addressed the part of being vulnerable, yeah. but she, can you speak to this quickly, please? So for this, I'll say walk in love. Um, the greatest commandment God gave to us in, in the Bible, the New Testament, love one another. And God's love is unconditional, right? I don't do something for you because of what I expect in return. That's not God's kind of love. Right, so when you are doing things for people, it should be from a place of I am sharing God's love and a channel through which God's love is getting to this person, is reaching to this person, and not necessarily because I expect something in return from this person. I heard a story from one of um, my senior, my bonds, and I was just going to share it um, quickly. She mentioned that there's this particular lady that God was always laying in her heart to give her something. Every time she sees this lady in church, she will give her something. Every time she sees this lady in church, she will give her something. But this lady never greets her. Sometimes she looks back and she sees this lady's eye in her. Like, this lady is, you know how you give to people and you expect them to be appreciative and they say hello to you? This lady was the complete opposite of that. But God 
kept saying to her, keep giving to this lady, keep giving to this lady. Eventually, after some years, when she said yes, everybody was like, ah, you know, it, it takes a lot to keep giving to someone who is not reciprocative or appreciative of that love. So for me, the answer to that question will be walk in love. God's kind of love, which is unconditional and not dependent on how the person will respond to you. Let Thank me you. just add this. It's very difficult. Yeah, yes. yeah it, it's very, very difficult, right? Um, I think you must have an opportunity to correct the person that I don't know why they're, what I'm giving you, you don't, you don't want it or you don't like it, right? It's good to walk in love. You don't expect it. But as human beings, it's so difficult. Remember the 10 leopards? The one that came back, Jesus blessed him and said, you are made whole, right? Even God expects us to be grateful. And so if we see an attitude of ingratitude, we must correct it and tell the people that you can't control this way because otherwise you will repel people. People wouldn't want to give you anything. That's what I would say. Thank you so much for that, sir, for, for bringing that balance there. So walk in love and as opportunities present themselves for correction, please don't hesitate to correct in love as well because sometimes we might also take that position of correcting as source. You are not the source. Yeah. You are simply a channel. And God can always raise someone else to meet that need. But not withholding a good deed from people because of how they are postured or how they are behaving towards you is working in love and also correcting them in love. All right. We've come to the end of today's Unplugged Conversations. Can you please help me appreciate Pastor Samson and also Pastor Chi? And I'm going to ask Pastor Sam to just lead us in prayer as we wrap up. Hallelujah. Can we just be upstanding, you know? Quiet is this song that talks about, you know, um, um, Spirit leads me well. My trust is with the borders. Let me walk upon the waters. Wherever you will call me. Take me deeper than my mindset on generosity. You come from a culture that you are not generous. Not because you don't want to give, but inept in you, you can't give. You are unconsciously stingy. I'm not trying to judge you. Let me raise your hand. I just want to pray with you that God will help you work in generosity. There's grace for it, for you to work in generosity. You want God to help you. God should heal your mindset of that posture of being a person that is struggling to walk with God in the place of generosity. I want you to lift up your hands and let's pray. I want to pray with you. You can see your hand. Let's pray. Let's just pray for grace. Let's pray for grace that God will grant you grace to be generous. That God will heal you of where you're coming from. That God will take away that mindset. That will be a paradigm shift in you. Let's ask God for healing. Let's ask God for healing. In these days, out of the horsemen, God will be making demand on us, you know, to give in spite of the little we have that the widow was terrified. And that is the pathway to abundance. That is the pathway to abundance. Let's lift up your mind and let's pray. Let's pray. Let's ask God for grace. Let's ask God for grace. Let's ask God for grace that God will help you in this season. That God will help you to navigate all the twists and turns. That God will heal your mind. The Bible said, is there no band in Gilead? Indeed, there is a band here this morning or this afternoon. Father, we trust you as many the Lord are struggling, oh God. We ask for healing, oh God. 
We ask for restoration, my Father. Whatever the canker one has eaten, on account of this challenge, we ask for restoration. We ask for restoration. We ask for restoration in the name of the Lord Jesus. We ask for restoration. Lord, we receive restoration in the name of the Lord Jesus. Father, we thank you. Father, we thank you. Amen. God asked me a question early this morning. And I want to ask you, can you trust God? That's the question God asked me. Can you trust God? And it's not that easy to say that you can trust God. You can cry, you can weep, you can, you know, do all sorts of things. But can you trust God? And I realized that I struggle with it. Because when it comes to the place of sacrifice, I'm not talking of giving now. Of dealing with my spouse sometimes when I'm offended. It takes me time. And I want us to pray this morning that God, I want to trust you. I want to trust you. In these days, I want to trust you. The Bible said that those that trust in the Lord would never be ashamed. Can we lift up our hands and let's ask for grace. Lift up your hands. Grace to trust God. Grace to trust God. Lord, we receive grace to trust you. Grace to trust you in this season. Oh, let's grace to trust you, Lord. The, the songwriter says, Spirit leads me where my trust is without borders. Choir, can you lift up that song? Oh, lift up your hands and let's ask for grace. Let's ask for grace. Let's ask for grace. Let's ask for grace. Oh, Spirit leads me where my great trust is without border. Lord, let me walk upon the waters in this season, O oh God. La mande se follow the zebra de halaba. Mendole prede si taliando bali hataya. Mandole prede si toliande prede halaba. Masa toliando libra de halaba. Masa taliaba haya. We want to trust you, O oh God. We want to trust you, my Father. But help our unbelief, my Father. Help our faith increase our faith. Increase our faith, O oh God. Help our unbelief. Masa pale de zekeli mande, jele mande sika de halaba. Take me deeper, my Father. Where my feet, O oh God, will wander. Mahinde sila daman seliande hila limbro si talian mazita mande halabo zibrade si talamanda haya. Father, we thank you for your grace. We thank you for your grace to trust you. And Lord, help us to be stewards of your blessings. Steward of your blessings, my Father. Faithful steward. Grace to be faithful. Grace to be faithful. We receive it in the name of our Lord Jesus. Thank you, our Father. In Jesus' mighty name, I pray. Lastly, I just want to pray with some people. Over 33 years ago, I, I decided to accept Jesus as my Lord and Savior. And honestly, over the years, it's never been better yesterday. It's from one glory to another. It's from one glory to another. Challenges will come. Difficulties will come. Issues will come. But I've seen the hand of God that has kept me and I showed me mercy. And I want to pray with some people this afternoon. You've never professed, you've never opened your mouth to say, Jesus, I want you to come into my life. I want to walk with you. I'm tired of playing games with you, Lord. I've been in this for a while, but I am not standing. I'm struggling. Can you lift your hands up? I want to pray with you. I want to pray with you this morning. I want to pray. Is there anyone in us that wants to say that I want to receive Christ? I want him to be my Lord and Savior. I want him to help me. I've been struggling. But Lord, today I want to take a decision with you. I want to be a very committed person. Or you gave your life to Christ, but you've been playing games with God. 
And today you want to say, God, I want to be serious with you. In these days, I want you to trust me with wealth. I want you to trust me with something. You know, is there anyone online or anyone? I don't know if you're online. Yes. Is there anyone? Yes, I can see your hand. God bless you, my brother. God bless you. I can see your hand. Is there, are there more people? Is there someone that you are tired of playing games with God? You know, you want to say God should help you, right? I can see your hand. Yeah. My brother, I want you to repeat after me. And this one on the line. He said, Father. You repeat after me. Say, Father. Father, in the name of Jesus. I come before you this afternoon. I surrender my life. I surrender my will and my desires to you. Lord, I want you to be my Lord and my Savior. Help me, my Father, to walk with you. Thank you, Lord, for receiving me. Thank you, Lord, for your grace. And thank you, Lord God, for fulfilling your will and your purpose in my life even from today. I give you glory and I give you thanks. In Jesus' mighty name I pray. Amen. Please meet someone after the service and let's give God praise. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.